Hello friends, welcome to Dr. Sai Physiology Academy, DOPA for short. This is the place where we make the learning of physiology easy, exciting, and effective. Thank you for joining me. So if you're new to this channel, you're especially welcome. And if you love the content we share, can you click the like button? Also click the subscribe button so that you don't get to miss any new content we share by clicking the notification bell so that you get to be notified whenever we share new content. All right, so let's get started. So now, gastrointestinal secretion. Okay, no, we started by saying that in the introductory lectures, we started by saying that cardinal functions of the GIT is motility, secretion, digestion, and absorption. Okay, so now in earlier lectures, we've dealt with motility, all the motility functions from the mouth down to the anus. So now we are still going to do the same thing, the secretory functions of the GIT from the mouth down to the anus. All right, so let's get one or two things, basic foundation about secretion. Now, one thing special about GIT secretion is that they are conducted specially through ducts, okay? And they open directly into the lumen of the GIT. You know, the GIT is a tract. It's a long tube that we say that it's about 20 feet, 20 feet long, okay? In uh, autopsy um, specimens, they can be as wide as long as um, 30 feet because well, the muscles are no longer contracted, so they, that's just the reason. Okay, so they open into that lumen. The lumen, the GIT lumen, is continuous with the outside environment, the external environment. So those things they open into it, unlike what we call ductless glands or endocrine. So these ones that have ducts, they are called exocrine, exo, exocrine glands. Okay? So that's one of the things about the GIT, those accessory glands, they open into the GIT through ducts. All right, so something you also need to know about GIT secretion is that the same mechanism, because we always, we always make it clear that effectors, that's the things that implement the physiological processes that we see, are what? Muscles and glands, especially smooth muscles. All right, so the glands are stimulated. You have to be stimulated, and it's either through chemical means or electrical means. And stimulated to signal to them that it is time to do this work. If it's muscle, it is time to contract and bring about this function. If it's a gland like this exocrine gland, they are stimulated also. Nervous stimulation, and also hormones, which is the chemical part of the stimulation hormones, okay? These are the things that stimulate, stimulants. Now, two basic things you need to know. One is that what is the content, general content of all GIT secretions? The most abundant there is water. Let's write it here, constituents. Or we call it composition. Composition of GIT. One is water. Usually up to 99.5%. Okay? Then another one, you have electrolytes. Electrolytes. 
Number three, you have very important enzymes. Different types of enzymes. So all these make up just about 0.5%. This general composition. So what differs is the kinds of electrolytes, which most of them are almost the same. Sodium, chloride, magnesium, phosphate, calcium, electrolyte. It's now the enzymes that most times differ. Okay? Okay? So there's something I need to chip in because sometimes it can get you confused when you hear them. Now, sometimes you hear serous, serous secretion. You can hear mucus, mucus secretion. So GIT secretion, sometimes it can be serous, it can be mucus. What do we mean by that? Serous, it comes from the word serum. Okay, he's just talking about that fact that that secretion has a lot, it's watery, it's serous, okay? Because all these secretions, as we'll talk about later, that they come from the blood, serum. So that's where it came from. Then mucus is just telling you the fact that that secretion has a lot of mucus. This is the adjective, mucus secretion. It has a lot of mucus. This mucus comes from a protein known as mucin. Okay, so mucin plus water gives you mucus. So mucus is very, very thick. Okay, thick and slimy. Thick and slimy okay so some secretions are, mu are mucus secretions some are serous so we're we going to be using this term so that you don't get confused now so the next thing why this diagram is here is just to explain the basic mechanism of git secretion basic mechanism now beginning from here of course, this is a blood vessel because everything, the raw material needed to manufacture that secretion, whatever it contains, the electrolytes, the water, the enzymes, which are organic substances, are gotten from nutrients. All raw materials in the body are gotten from what you eat, which enters the bloodstream. Okay? So, the nutrients, they enter this the capillary okay so the capillary supplies nutrients everything that the normal cell needs nutrients oxygen all of that this is the basement membrane bm so this is the nerve that can stimulate it this is a nerve okay this here stimulates the cell so now the nutrients, the raw materials have entered the cell. So after raw materials have entered into the cell, okay? So they start the process of proteins to synthesize the specific enzyme that the cell needs to secrete. So that's, these are ribosomes located on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, okay? So the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they finish the manufacturing process. So these are molecules here, the protein molecules have been synthesized, transferred to the Golgi apparatus. So what does the Golgi apparatus do? It is the site of packaging. It packages, brands it, labels it, and all of that. So it's now complete and it puts them inside what's known as secretory vesicles. Secretory vesicles. So these vesicles, they are already prepared. So the next thing, once a stimulus comes, either through nerve or through hormones or paracrine secretions and all of that, then the process 
of this exocytosis happen. That's what these vesicles, they will go to this membrane here, attach to it and extrude all this, their, their content. You see that? So this is exocytosis. So this content enters, it's connected into a duct. So the duct now opens into the lumen of the GIT. So this is the basic what happens. All different kinds of glands, accessory glands and all of that, it's different cells. Okay, so now the next thing we're going to just talk about before we go deep specifically into the different secretions is that when you want to talk about a particular gland, its secretion, one of the things you always talk about, you must mention the gland. What's the name of the gland? That gland is made up of cells. Some of these cells, they have special names. Okay? You mention the type of cell. The type of cell, this is a general cell we are just using as a foundation. So you mention the type of cell that secretes that substance. All right. So the next thing you would like to talk about is now the composition of that particular secretion. Okay. So the composition usually has the same water, electrolytes. They don't change more. What really changes is the organic part of it, which is mainly enzymes and some other organic substances that really change. So you just talk on what that secretion really, really contains. Okay. The next is what is now the function of that secretion as it regards GIT in general. What does it do? What if it's digestion? What does it digest? And some other constituents, what do they Smaller other smaller functions they also perform. You mentioned that. Then the next thing you want to mention is how is it regulated that particular secretion? Is it through nervous and hormonal mechanism? Or sometimes it can be only nervous. We'll see, we'll see that sometimes only nervous, special gland like that, that only nervous stimulation and regulation that it has. So when you talk about that, that's the basic thing we just talk about. The functional anatomy, the gland, the name, the cells, constituents of the secretion, and so on. So now we're going to now start from the mouth. We are only starting from the mouth. And what happens in the mouth is what? Saliva. That's the GIT secretion. We all know saliva, very common because it's in the mouth too. You can just spit, brah, saliva comes out. So we're going to talk about how that saliva is important as it regards gastrointestinal functions. All right? We'll talk about that after this break. Right, welcome back. So now we want to now start the main gist of salivary secretion, beginning from the mouth. Saliva is what is produced in the mouth. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is the gland? What is the name of the gland or the group of glands that produce the saliva? Now, the special thing about saliva is that it's not just one gland that produces saliva. There are three. Okay, so saliva is produced by number one, called the parotid. Parotid gland. Number two, submandibular. Man it's also called submaxillary. Okay, then number three is sub lingual okay so this parotid gland is the largest in terms of physical size but when it comes to the contribution what they contribute to the volume of saliva this one contributes the most let's 
look at what they contribute. This one contributes about 25% to salivary secretion, the volume. Why this one contributes 65 to 70%? So much. Even if this one is bigger than it in size, okay? Then this one contributes 5 to 10%. So the salivary glands, this is how they are represented. So this arrow here is just telling you about what we mentioned earlier. They are receiving nutrients, raw materials, all these cells. These cells, for example, this water, it can be sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, whatever from the blood, they are entering through these cells. Now, the salivary glands, the cells there, so they are made up of something that resembles grapes. So that's the grape, the grape-like form is this, what is represented here. Okay, so this is called the asinus. Asinus. It's also called alveoli. Okay, don't be confused. It's not the alveolar in the lungs. The lungs also have similar stuff. They are bags. They are like bags. Alveoli. Even the breast. You also refer to. So alveolar is just talking about something that has this sac-like structure. So it's like a bunch of grapes. So this is like the stalk. So there are many like this attached. Okay? That's how the salivary glands are formed. That's how they are shaped and designed. So this is their sinus, this thing here. So all these cells here, individual cells, they are now called asina cells. So when they receive these raw materials, what do they do? They secrete them into this space here, which now flows. So here is now the duct. This one's, these cells here, these are also cells. So they're called ductile cells. So always remember, you have the asinus cells. You have the ductile cells. So the asinus cells, mainly, they, are, they secrete substances that are rich in enzymes. Why this ones secrete more of electrolytes, bicarbonate, water, and so on, this duct. Okay? So as they secrete into this place, it flows down. Substances are added and removed. Here you have sodium. Sodium. Here you have potassium. So potassium is added from this place, this point of major secretion. So as it's going down, the fluid, the secretion is being transformed. The constituent, the composition is being transformed a little. So what ends up entering is not the same as this origin here. Okay? So sodium leaves it. And you know that sodium is mainly responsible for the osmolarity of body fluids. So once sodium leaves a fluid, that fluid becomes what? Hypotonic. Okay? So the secretion at this level is isotonic because it's just coming from the plasma, the blood. So at this point, it is isotonic. isotonic at this part. So when it gets to this end here, it becomes hypotonic. Alright? So note that. So another thing that enters here is bicarbonate. Bicarbonate enters. Then here, going out, Chloride. Alright, so this is how salivary secretion, this is how it's done. From the asinus cells, rich in enzyme, isotonic, 
it goes down, 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 down. All right? So the constituents, like we said, usually you have water. Let's talk a little about the composition of salivary secretion. One, water, which makes up 99.5%. So the remaining 0 0.5, 0.5% are solids. Okay? Water, then solids. Then these solids can now divide it into organic, and in organic. So this organic mainly is now the enzymes. And so what is the major enzyme I should never forget? Is what? Thialine. Okay? Major enzyme. That's also known as salivary amylase. We'll talk about the functions. Remember we said we'll talk about functions. So it's also called salivary amylase. Okay? So another enzyme, this enzyme one, let's put it here, enzyme one. So enzyme two, another very important enzyme that you should not forget. Lysozyme. Lyso. Lysozyme. Lysozyme. We'll talk about the functions, but just know it. Then another one. You can also have lingual lipase. Lingual lipase. Then you can also have phosphatase. Okay? But if you should not forget anyone, never forget thialine, salivary amylase, and lysozyme. They play very, very major functions. So this are the enzyme organic. Then inorganic, you now have electrolytes, sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, and so on. Okay, just there are so many phosphates, all of that for the inorganic. So these are the constituents of the salivary, salivary secretion. So now from this constituents, what is the, or rather what are the functions of the salivary secretion? Okay, I'm gonna take it one after the other. So water, the most abundant constituent of salivary secretion. So the water helps to, you know, moisten the mouth, okay? So it helps to moisten, moisten the mouth. So that moisturization, it aids in speech. If your mouth is so dry without saliva, you find that it will be difficult for you to talk because your tongue cannot move well. You know, the tongue is, plays a very important role in speech. So when there's, your mouth is moist, that lubrication, okay? Part of the, this uh, hair, part of this organic is also mucin. Mucin. So the mucin helps in lubrication. Lubrication, okay. The water moistens it, then mixture with that mucin, everything, mucus, it helps to lubricate. So that lubrication also will now help in swallowing. You know this one, it's in speech, okay. Then in swallowing, saliva helps in swallowing. Then now, look at this lysozyme, okay. Lysozyme, what does it do? Lysozyme has antibacterial effect. It kills microorganisms. So, number two, it has protective function. Protective function. Okay, the saliva. That's why people who lack 
enough adequate salivary secretion. They usually it's called that that um, situation that condition is called xerostomia. Xerostomia. So they usually have dental caries. Dental caries. Okay, that's a problem that has to do with infection that destroys the, the teeth, the enamel and all of that due to the effect of overgrowth of microorganisms. Okay, it destroys the teeth. So it has protective function because of this lysozyme. Alright, then you now have lingual lipase. Lipase are usually lipids that help to digest lipids. But the main digestive enzyme is the salivary amylase. And that salivary amylase is called tyalin. Okay, it's also called tyalin, salivary amylase, like we mentioned there. So, digestive function. It has digestive function. So, basically, these are functions of the salivary secretion. All right, so what are we to talk next? How is the salivary secretion regulated? Is it every time you just start secreting saliva? What stimulates salivary secretion? What inhibits it? Okay, so let's talk about regulation. So interestingly, this salivary secretion, unlike other secretions of the GIT, is regulated only by a nervous mechanism. Okay? So it is regulated only a nervous mechanism. Okay, so hormones do not play a role in the regulation of salivary secretion. So what do you think can stimulate or inhibit salivary secretion? One of them is the presence of food. The presence of food in the mouth. Once you put food in your mouth and start chewing, salivary secretion starts. Because they are mechano receptors. So this presence of food has two effects. Okay? Mechano receptors, stretch receptors that detect that there is food through nervous mechanism. And also, it stimulates the nerves through chemical means also. Because food itself is chemicals. Okay? And with your taste buds, they detect something, chemical change especially if that food is your favorite food, okay? So this food, through mechanical and chemical, chemical stimulation. So the carries, we say it's a nervous mechanism, carries, sends information through the nerves, and it's usually nerve seven, cranial nerve seven, which is the facial nerve and cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal, glossopharyngeal nerve. These are the nerves that carry the information, the afferent to the control center, and then the efferent that will now come and stimulate the glands to secrete. Okay, so that control center is salivatory nucleus. So the control center is called the salivatory nucleus. Control center. Salivatory nucleus is located, I think, between the medulla and the pons. A part of that's the brain stem, medulla and pons are part of the brain stem. Okay, so that's the control center through these nerves, efferent, afferent. So they secrete. Then also, 
if it has been found that smooth material, apart from just food, smooth substances stimulate salivary secretion. Then rough substances inhibit salivary secretion. You see that? So it's also through that mechanical means the tongue and everything able to this thing is smooth. Maybe it resembles food. Okay? Then something also very important that does not depend on any physical contact, chemical, whatever, is the smell of food and the sight of food. That one is a learned reflex, or you call it conditioned reflex. We are not born, it's not inborn, but with time, the man performed that brought about our knowledge of this mechanism is Pavlov. It's the Pavlov, Pavlov experiment. He did experiment with dogs, you know? You ring a bell, then give the dog food. Ring a bell, give the dog food. So it comes to a time where you just ring the bell even without giving the dog food. The dog starts to salivate. It happens to human beings. When you perceive a very nice aroma of food, or you see food, you want, you're about to eat, you start salivating. It's a feed-forward mechanism. It's anticipatory. So it starts secreting, waiting for the food. So this is the regulation. When the food, you swallow the food, there's no food for a long time. The stimulation stops and the salivary secretion goes down. So this is basically what you need to know about salivary secretion. Okay? So that amylase that we said is part of the digestive function, it digests carbohydrates. Okay? Very important for you to know. Carbohydrate digestion starts in the mouth. Very important question that can be asked. Okay? So this is basically what you need to know about salivary secretion. Okay? The main, the glands, the types of cells, the process, the composition, which we talked about, inorganic, organic water, then functions, then regulation. Nobody will crucify you if you mention these basic things. Okay? So for further reading, I've written a book on gastrointestinal physiology broken down for you. Okay? Very easy to understand. And all the books in physiology, about seven of them for now. So you can check the description box. You see the link to the soft copy of the book. So you can download it just for a token in the CADA books. For further reading, you get a better graphs, other details. All right? So also check the description box. You see our website there. The link is also there. Visit our website. You see that there are other things that we do to make the learning of physiology easy, exciting, and effective. Okay? So see you in the next video.